2. Faith and the Church Sometimes a problem can best be understood if approached indirectly. As a result, let us consider the nature of the family as a step towards understanding the Church. C.C. Zimmerman, in his excellent study of Family and Civilization, 1946, identified families as trustee families, domestic families, and atomistic families. The trustee family is clearly the biblical pattern. It is society's basic institution. It is a law centre as well as a life centre, and it is the basic governing force. At this point, a serious problem develops. The trustee family includes more than the biblical family. The family life of old China, with its ancestor worship, definitely qualifies, as does ancestor worship everywhere. Pagan Germanic families in some cases also qualify. In other words, while Zimmerman's classification is very useful and essentially sound, its nature is such that it is inclusive of forms of family life without reference to their religious and moral content. The same is true of the church. Too often the church is defined in terms of its polity, that is, congregational, Presbyterian or Episcopal, or a particular practice, as with the Baptists. Again, it can be defined in terms of a creed or confession, so that conformity to a definition of the faith is the mark of the church. It would be a serious error to underrate the importance of these considerations, but it is also a serious error to overemphasize them. The Church is nothing apart from Jesus Christ, and correctness on these other points, however good, cannot replace faith in Him. The families of old China and the families of faithful Israel were alike trustee families, but each was informed and motivated by a radically different faith. Stickler stated the case clearly. Still another reason why so much importance is given to faith in religion is found in the fact that it is the parental, the fontal grace, the source of all the other graces, the grace we must have before we can have any other. Obedience to God, the love of God and more are all important, but faith is the fontal grace. Faith is the instrumental condition of salvation. Faith gives reality to the commandments of God and secures obedience to them. Therefore, by faith the elders, the saints of former days, obtained a good report from God and men. Faith gives reality to the declarations of God concerning the plan of salvation and secures compliance with its terms. Therefore, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. Faith gives reality to the warnings of God and prompts to the use of the needful means, divinely provided, to escape the dangers to which they point. Therefore, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Faith gives reality to the promises of God and induces the soul to rely on them and to fulfil the conditions on which they are to be fulfilled. Therefore, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Faith gives reality to the blessings and glories of God's eternal kingdom, and inspires the soul with courage and strength to do and to suffer anything that it may at last be found amongst those of whom the world is not worthy. Therefore, by faith, many suffered trials of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, 
of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. They wandered in the deserts and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. Such is the power of faith. Such servants of the Lord can it make. Such victories can it win. Such deeds of righteousness can it perform. But faith is not something in and of itself, nor is it of man. It is faith in Jesus Christ. It is also God's gift to us. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 For the church to stress the centrality of faith means that it is not the institution or its forms which mark it as a church, but something more than itself, something which is from God, the grace of faith. Without for a moment surrendering its Baptist, Presbyterian or Episcopal nature, the more strong any one of these churches becomes in the faith, the less it stresses its own distinctives and the more it stresses the distinctives of Christ and the Word. The Bible stresses the centrality of faith in the calling of Abraham. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For when he was but one, I called him, and I blessed him, and made him many. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 and 2. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham my friend, thou whom I have taken hold of from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the corners thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8 to 10. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with the faithful Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, verse 9. What Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 9 is that faith, our reliance on the gift of God, blesses us together with Abraham. This faith is set forth in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. To understand the meaning of this, we must first recognize that Abraham was called of God. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. The initiative was entirely from the Lord, who created Abraham, gave him faith, called him, and established a covenant with him. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 21. Second, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, we see the nature of the faith which God gave to Abraham. The word translated, believed, is related to our English word, Amen, which is close to its Hebrew original. It means trust. Paul tells us, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. God declares to Abraham, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. Genesis chapter 15 verse 1. Abraham rests in this fact, and he lives in terms of it. He says, Amen to God. This meant, concretely, that he believed God when God declared that, although now childless, he would have, in due time, a posterity as numerous as the visible stars. Genesis chapter 15 verse 5 Third, we are told that God counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham had said Amen to God. The Septuagint translates this word sometimes as pistos, faithful, and sometimes as alethanos, true, real or truth. 
The word counted or reckoned means imputed. As Girdlestone noted, It would follow that the passage does not teach us that Abraham's faith was regarded or estimated by God as if it were righteous, the one quality being taken for the other, but that owing to the fact that he had faith in the promises, God accepted him, acquitted him from the charge of sin, pronounced him righteous, and conferred on him an inheritance. However, as von Rad points out, this imputation is covenantal. It presupposes an existing communal relationship. God is righteous so long as he abides by this covenant. Man is righteous so long as he affirms the regulations of this communal relationship established by God, that is, the covenants and the commandments. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 5 speaks of this covenant faithfulness. Thus, man is called into the covenant by grace, given faith by grace, and sent forth to act in obedience to that faith and the covenant law. Fourth, this imputation is, as Leopold stated, a purely forensic act. The covenant with God is a legal relationship Abraham's faith is within the context thus of law, but it is more personal because of that fact. The modern mind separates the legal and the personal because humanism has made law statist and abstract and hence impersonal. This is not true in the reality of God's creation. My relation to my wife is personal because it is legal because it meets God's law. An illegal sexual relationship is impersonal and exploitive. In Scripture, the more faithful we are to God's law, the more close and personal is our relationship to Him and to our fellow men. It is a serious error to import the impersonalism of humanistic thoughts and law into biblical thought. Faith, it is important to remember the nature of Abraham's faith. As Atkinson pointed out, this faith has two aspects. Abraham believed God's promise that he, Abraham, would have a son, and he acted on that belief by committing himself to God. God expanded that promise to Abraham with a large grant of land to his posterity. Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 to 21. Thus, faith involves believing in God and believing in His promises. The two are inseparable. We believe in God's promises when we commit ourselves, our hopes and our todays and tomorrows to the Lord. We cannot spiritualize faith and separate it from God's promises. Abraham's hope was for a son. Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? Genesis chapter 15, verse 2 This is a concrete, temporal and material hope, and it was obviously pleasing to God and blessed by God. The promises of God to his covenant people are fully material and temporal, as well as eternal and spiritual. It is this faith which must mark the church. Too often the church identifies faith with itself and faithfulness with loyalty to the institutional forms and practices. It then seeks conformity rather than faith. The history of the faith is studded with such perversions. For example, in the France of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the Society of the Holy Sacrament sought to locate and punish dissent from the institution of the Church. Formal compliance, combined with cynicism, was not persecuted. Bounty hunters were given one-third of the fines if they ferreted out offenders. The alternative to such an evil is not indifference to false doctrine, but the cultivation of sound teaching and a sound faith Thus, 
the traditional marks of the true church are good but limited. A formerly correct church is not necessarily a faithful church. Abraham believed in God, and he acted on his faith. So does a true church 